and good study, good teaching of your word. We're so grateful for, for every Wednesday that you've given us. And Father, today we thank you for the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, who helps us to understand and interpret Scripture. Help us in general just to rely on you and not ourselves and to guide us and help us to understand the lesson that Ralph has prepared for us today. Thank you for the gifts you've given him and his strength and willingness to share them. Now help us turn our thoughts to the study of your word. And it is with grateful hearts we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Help me welcome Dr. Ralph Wall. Amen. Good to be here. Glad you could make it here today. We're going to have a Bible class. If you open your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 4, this is an opportunity for you to study the Word of God for the next three or four hours, and uh, I, I hope you enjoy it. I hope you had a big meal. <laughs> this is a privilege, and so each week we remind you that if you're here today and you do not have a personal relationship with Christ, it means you're not a Christian, it means you have no hope in eternity, and it means you will not understand the Bible class today. 1 Corinthians 2.14 tells us that the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, neither can he know them. It requires a spiritual discernment. So once you invite Christ into your life, then God the Holy Spirit indwells every believer. And he will guide you in truth, and you can understand the Scriptures. And I, I could give personal testimony to having read the Bible, or trying to read the Bible as a non-Christian, and uh, finally uh, getting disgusted with the begots, and they would beget me, so I would, <laughs> I would say to people that, you know, nobody can understand the Scripture. So, this sounds a little feedback here. Are you getting a little feedback out there? No. Okay. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. I want to start over? No. <laughs> if you have unconfessed sins in your life, <laughs> you have to agree with God concerning a sin. So we try to clear the air before you study the Word of God, and uh, uh, no more lesson is more important to you today than what we have before us today. We're in a, a very serious time in the nation of Israel. David has been king of Judah for seven and a half years. And during those seven and a half years, they've had civil war. Now, the civil war has continued, and Israel, the 11 tribes to the north, were fighting against Judah, the one tribe to the south. And uh, they were recognizing Ishbosheth as their king, and uh, uh, <laughs> David was the king of Judah. So this battle had been going on back and forth. Now, when a king dies, there is a succession to the throne, and it's familial. So if you're in the family of Saul, then you're still in the succession to the throne. So when Saul was killed on Mount Gilboa, the next in line was Jonathan. And Jonathan, of course, was killed right alongside Saul. And then we have the two boys, Abinadab and Malkishua, and they were also killed there on Mount Gilboa. But there's one man named Ishbosheth who was not there. And I really believe that Abner had squirreled him away someplace, you know, uh, hidden him out because he wanted him to be the next king. Abner, we've learned a lot about Abner. Abner is all for Abner. Yeah, you got that right. And Abner was trying to build his own uh, uh, nation uh, out of uh, using the, the uh, one son that was left, and that's Ishbosheth. And so that's what's going on. And so in the line of succession, we have Ishbosheth, and you have one other uh, person, and that's a man by the name of Mephibosheth. Don't forget that name. I know it just rolls off your tongue, but it's, uh, it's one that we're going to be introduced to today, but we don't get to him uh, in, in, uh, uh, in force until we get to chapter 9. So let's begin in verse 1 of chapter, uh, chapter 4. When Saul's son, that's Ishbosheth, he's the king of, of Israel, heard that Abner had died in Hebron, he lost heart and all Israel was troubled. So when Abner was killed, how did Abner die? Joab took care of him outside the gate of Hebron. That's right. Joab took care of Abner. So now Abner is, uh, Abner is dead and Ishbosheth lost it. That's what it says there. Well, Ishbosheth with all hat and no cattle. He, he, he was a puppet. He was, he was on a string and Abner was pulling the string. And so when Abner died, Ishbosheth didn't know what to do. 
Now Saul's son had two men who were captain of the troops. These are petty, literally, literally petty officers. The captains of the troops, the name was Beana, the name was, uh, other was Rechab, the sons of Remen, the Berothite of the children of Benjamin, for Beroth also was a part of Benjamin. Now they're telling you that because uh, Saul had chased uh, the, them out of uh, uh, Benjamin, out of uh, Beroth, and they went to Gidim. Verse next verse says, because the Beroth uh, Thites fled to Gidim. That's 18 miles away because Saul chased them away. But he's trying to make it clear now that they're still in, in Benjamin, and Benjamin is the northern kingdom, and Benjamin is the tribe of Saul. So they're trying to make it clear that they were still part of the uh, Benjamites Get, and have been sojourners until this day. Look, they're still running. Now, this is a, uh, verse 4 is a parenthetical inclusion where we're introduced to Mephibosheth. It says, Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son who was lame in his feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jez, uh, Jezreel. Uh, that, that was that Saul and Jonathan were killed. So they got the news now. So they got the news, then they fled. Why were they fleeing? Because they were going to be killed. That's what they thought. Saul's dead. They're going to kill all the descendants, all the heirs uh, to the throne. And that's what they thought they were doing. So as they're running, he's only five years old. The nurse took him up and fled, and happened as she had, uh, had made haste to flee, that he fell and became lame, and his name was Mephibosheth. Well, that was five, five years old when he, this happened. Uh, he broke his, his feet or his ankles. We don't know what happened, but now he's a cripple, and he's only five years old. But now he's 12 years old because seven and a half years have passed since then. So he's a 12-year-old boy, and that's all, that's all the scripture is going to mention about Mephibosheth at this point. But we will come back around in chapter 9 and find out more about him. Then the sons of Remen, you won't believe this, the sons of Remen, the Berothite, Rechab and Beana, set out and came about the heat of the day to the house of Ishbosheth, who was lying on his bed at noon. So he's taking a little power nap at noon, the king was. And remember, he's already lost it. And they came there all the way into the house as though to get wheat. So apparently the granary was also in the house of the king. Sort of like I suppose in, uh, in when Joseph uh, was down in Egypt. You no, know, they came to Joseph to get the grain, and I, I guess that's what they did here. So they just walked on in the house to get the wheat, and there he was in that bed. They stabbed him in the stomach, and Rechab and Beana, his brothers, escaped. They ran for their life. So they walked in, to, uh, pretending to get grain. They see the king taking a nap, and they kill him. For when they came into the house, he was lying on his bed in his bedroom. They struck him and killed him, beheaded him, and took his head, and were all night escaping through the plain. The plain is the Arabah. The Arabah, Arabah is the Jordan Valley. So they ran from Mahanaim, which is up in Gad, all the way down to Hebron, hang, uh, holding this head of Ishbosheth. You've got a picture of that, I hope, uh, there. And they're taking that head to uh, <coughs> David. They brought the head of Ishbosheth to David at Hebron and said to the king, Here is the head of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, your enemy, who sought your life, and the Lord has avenged my Lord the king of this day of Saul and his descendants. They're saying, this is the last descendant. Don't worry about it. It's all clear now for you to become the king of Israel. And that's what uh, David wants to do. He wants to unite the southern kingdom with the northern kingdom. He wants to be king of Israel because God has already had him anointed king of Israel. He is the king of Israel, but he's not in place yet. So these guys cut off the head of the king, bring the head of the king to to David and says, it's all clear now for you to be the king of Israel. We helped you out a little bit. And actually, they even bring the Lord's name in there. You see that? The Lord has avenged my Lord, the king, this day. So the Lord did this. David answered. Now, I could, have, I could tell him what David's going to say because we remember the Malachite. And that's what David's going to bring up. But David answered Rechab and beyond his brother, the sons of Remen, the Berothites, and said to them, As the Lord lives... 
who has redeemed my life from all adversity. You're going to see a change in 2 Samuel in the life of David. David has been running for 10 years from Saul. Remember? 10 years he's been a fugitive. Now he's back in Hebron. He's been anointed king of Judah. And you're going to see that David has learned a lot of lessons while he was running for those 10 years. And the lesson is that God will take care of all my adversities. Have you learned that lesson? I've heard it. You've heard it? <laughs> Telling is not hearing. But... I know, I know. You know, I, I recall, I was thinking about this. I remember a man uh, in my dental chair, I used to talk to people about the Lord. And uh, a lot of times I would say things to people that needed a response, but they couldn't respond. <laughs> So when I would get up, they would, they would ask a question. And one of the questions that came up after an event like that, the man said, well, well, what does it mean to wholly follow the Lord? Now, that's a good question, isn't it? I said, it means that you take the roof off your house and you put all the walls down flat and there's nothing that God can't see in your life. Am I all right so far? What does it mean to wholly follow the Lord? It means there's nothing in your life that would prevent God from being involved. There's nothing in your life that you don't consult the Lord about before you do it. You invite Him into anything that you're doing and you don't want to go someplace that He wouldn't go. That's what it means to wholly follow the Lord. And that's what David is saying in it. The Lord has taken care of all my diversities, all of my wars, all of my battles, all of these problems I've had. Saul could have killed me many times. There's no reason. Saul had this army. David had 600 men and, and they were shaky. You remember? And now he, he ran for 10 years and it never did catch him. In fact, he caught Saul a couple times. So he said, God has taken care of me. It's a big, it's a big question that that, that that man asked. How did, what does it mean? I remember shortly after I became a Christian, I'd, been, I'd known the Lord for probably three or four years and... Uh, this was a time when uh, dental insurance was just coming on the scene. It uh, was not prominent. Uh, everybody didn't have dental insurance at the time. And I was approached by a man who was the uh, CEO of a dental insurance company down in the center of town. And he called me down to one of these big buildings down in the center of Indianapolis. I'd known him. I'd been to parties with him. And, and he said, you know, we're going to start a dental insurance uh, branch of the insurance company. And we believe that you're the one to lead it. And uh, I, he said, we don't know what we're doing. We need advice. You'll be completely in charge. Uh, money is no problem. You can name your salary. You'll have a corner office overlooking uh, the center of town and all this. And I thought, well, you know, I hadn't seen this fellow for a while. I, said, well, I, I think you should know that I, I've become a Christian. <laughs> Now, he knew me. I mean, it, we were friends. I said, I've become a Christian. And he said something to me that really challenged me. He said, well, it hasn't affected your whole life, has it? <laughs> now, think about that. Oops. It hasn't affected your whole life, has it? Oops. Well, listen, folks. If it hasn't affected your whole life, it's not the real disease. <laughs> if any man be in Christ, is new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, some things become new. Is that right? All things, all things become new. And that's what, what he's talking about. God can take care of all your problems. God can handle all of your diversities. God can, can take all these things that we can, are fretting about. That's another question that came up in one of the conversations. A man said, all I do is fret all the time. I said, fret, do you mean by fret, worry? Well, worry is sin. Worry is telling God you can't handle that. And I know there wouldn't be anybody in a group like this, but there, maybe, maybe you know someone who, who, who's all wrapped up internally with worry or whatever it might be of something that you think is going to happen, and it rarely happens. You know that. How about that yeah. as well? But you think God can handle it? Oh, you're going to see this in David's life, and it's going to become more and more prominent. He just begins to shine. So he tells him, God has redeemed my life from all adversity. I should be dead, but I'm not. When so, verse 10. When someone told me, saying, Look, 
Saul is dead, thinking uh, to have brought good news, I arrested him and had him executed in Ziklag. That's the Amalekite who brought the bracelet from Saul, remember? He brought the bracelet and says, the king is dead. And, and he said, well, uh, who killed him? He said, well, I did. And one who thought I would give him a reward for the good news. And that's what these guys are thinking too, don't you see? How much more when wicked men have killed a righteous person? David refers to Ishbosheth as a righteous person. He's just a puppet, but he's righteous. a righteous puppet, I guess. In his own house, on his own bed, therefore shall I not now require his blood at your hand and remove you from the earth. That's pretty serious. Quick and speedy judgment. So David commanded his young men, they executed them, cut off their hands and their feet, and hanged them by the pool of Hebron. Ultimate uh, humility. Ultimate uh, disgust. When you see someone hanging, see the Jews buried their, their dead quickly, but not this man. They cut off his hands and his feet, which is shown that utterly disgust in this person's life. And they hang him up for everybody to see. But they took time to have a funeral for Ishbosheth. They buried uh, the head of uh, Ishbosheth in the tomb of Abner. They were relatives. Now forget there's a chapter division. We're, we're going to move on a little further. We're not going to stop after one chapter today. <clears throat> then. Then means. You know, you know what then means? It's a, it's a linking word. It means then. <laughs> then, after this, the king is dead. The king is dead. And they thought that that's the last descendant. It's not, but they thought that. So they bring the head, thinking they're going to get a reward. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and spoke, saying, Indeed, we are your bone and your flesh. They were Jews. They're all, uh, all Jews. We're bone of your bone, flesh of your flesh. Also in time past, when Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel out and brought them in. Remember they had that uh, country western song. Saul has killed his thousand, and David has killed his ten thousand. You were the warrior even when Saul was still king. You're the one who took him out and brought him in. You shall shepherd my people. The word shepherd is a word of honor there. Shepherd means to care for, as a shepherd would take care of the sheep. You're the one to take care of Israel, my people, and be ruler over Israel. So we want you to be king over Israel. Therefore, all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, and uh, you, sh you should read this parallel passage in uh, 1 Chronicles. 1 Chronicles chapter 11 through 14 gives you the same account that you're reading here. The words are almost the same, but their things are a little bit different. But you see all these different tribes that came down with the numbers that are with them. So all the elders of Israel came to the king of he at Hebron. King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. Now this is the third time that David's been anointed. He was anointed king over Judah, and Samuel anointed him in chapter 8 as king over Israel, remember? Mm -hmm. He took the son, the son of Jesse uh, aside and anointed him as king over Israel. Now this is the third time that he's been anointed, so he, he's pretty much anointed. David was 30, he was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned for 40 years. So he's seven and a half years, he reigned in Hebron 33 years over all of Israel. So he reigned for 40 years. He was 30 years old. How old was he when he died? 70. 70 years old. That's right. And the king and his men, this is very important now. Now, the, now David is king over all of Israel. Now we got a problem. The problem is David has made his capital Hebron. Hebron is down in Judah. And then Ishbosheth and Abner have made their, their, their capital up in Mahanaim. Mahanaim is up in, the, in Gad, just over the Jordan River, on the east side of Jordan River. So there's a lot of distance between the two, don't you see? Now David is thinking, what's in his mind is we've got to unite Israel. We've got to bring these, these factions that have been fighting for seven and a half years together. How are we going to do that? We're going to choose a new capital. Been hearing a lot about that lately. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, who spoke to David, saying, You shall not come in here, but the blind and the lame will rebel you, rebel, 
repel you, thinking David to, could not come. Now see, Jerusalem is a very interesting place. Jerusalem is on an elevated uh, mountain with three valleys on each side. So picture that now. You're elevated to the back. The only way people can t attack Jerusalem is from the north because you can see them coming in the valleys on the three valleys there. And Jerusalem is a wonderful place because, and, and God has put his stamp on Jerusalem already, don't you see? And we know that. Thank God that we are recognizing that uh, in our day. But he goes there and the Jebusites have inhabited Jerusalem. Josephus says that uh, the Jebusites have inhabited Jerusalem for 515 years. During the time of Joshua, Joshua ran them out of Jerusalem. And then they came back and ran Joshua out of Jerusalem. So now they're back in Jerusalem there. So the Jebusites are there. And what they're saying to David is, well, we won't get our whole army out. We'll just bring the blind and the lame out and they'll fight you and they'll defeat you. Now that's quite a challenge to a warrior, don't you think? Yes. And he said, don't worry about that. We'll just put a blind and a lame out there. Nevertheless, nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion. Zion is another name for the, for the Jebusites. But it became known as a, a, a word for that meant Jerusalem as well. Jerusalem and Zion are used interchangeably now. But it, it originally started with the Jebusites. So David took the stronghold of Zion. The, str the word stronghold means fortress there. That is the city of David. It became known as the city of David after he took it there. Here's how he did it. Now David said on that day, Whoever climbs up by way of the water shaft, the water course. David looked at the situation. He's a, he's a man of war. He's a warrior. He said, well, the only way in is through the water course. And, and defeats the Jebusites, the lame and the blind. Now, he's just repeating what he's heard there, uh, hated, who hated David's soul. He shall be chief and captain. So, I know the way to get in there. You need to go up the water course, course and whoever does will be chief and captain of the army. This is very important. Because Joab killed Abner, remember? And Joab killed Abner without the approval of the king. And so the king is now upset with Joab, and I think he's been excused from being the commander of the army of David, but now he's going to win back this title. And by the way, folks, when David became king of Israel, his army increased. It may be as large as 100,000 now because all the other tribes of, of, of Israel, you see, came to join his 600 men, and he's got quite an army. Now, he may, may not take them all at one time, but he's got an army and he needs a captain. So uh, he said, at this time, where was I? I lost my place here. Eight. 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 Okay, now David said on that day, whoever climbs up by way of the water shaft and defeats the Jebusites, the lame, the blind, who are hated by David, so he shall be chief and captain. Therefore, they say the blind and the lame shall not come into the house. Then David dwelt in the stronghold and called it the city of David. You have to read in uh, First uh, Chronicles to find out that Joab actually did that. He's the one who did it. And David built all around from Milo and inward. Milo, the word Milo means a, a landfill. And what he actually did, he terraced this landfill and made it very beautiful up there to the fortress uh, of Zion. And David went on and became great, and the Lord God of hosts was with him. Folks, what we're entering into now is the most prosperous time that Israel ever had. Under David and Solomon, it's never been, there's never been an Israel uh, like there will be. And David is starting right now. The Lord of hosts was with him. Did you read that? Tell me what I just said. God is with David. God is with David. Why is God with David? Because God, David has taken the roof off and the walls down and said, Lord, I'm all yours. I'm sold out completely. I'm not holding anything back. I want you to be God in my life. And God was with him. And the Lord of hosts was with him. Then, Hiram, this is another parenthetical inclusion there. This is not chronological, by the way, what we're studying here. Things just kind of enter in here and you have to take it for what it's worth. It's just thrown in here. Hiram, king of Tyre, uh, sent messengers to David and cedar trees and carpenters and masons and built David a house. Well, this didn't happen until 20 years later. 20 years later is when David built a house and then he began to think about building a temple as well. So David knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel and that he had exalted his kingdom 
for the sake of his people Israel. God had taken care of David. And David took up a more parenthetical inclusion here. While he was there in Jerusalem, David took more concubines and more wives from Jerusalem. So he's busy, remember? <laughs> we, we, show, we saw he had six uh, uh, sons in Hebron. Now we're going to increase that. He got more wives and more concubines uh, after he was in Hebron. Also, more sons and daughters were, bought to him, brought, were born to him. Actually, he ends up with 19 sons and one girl. The girl's name is Tamar. You remember her. <coughs> now, these are the names of the those, and you can read those yourself. You, I just take it by faith that I can't pronounce every one correctly. There. <laughs> Moving right on, 17. Now, when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines went up to search for David. The Philistines are upset with David. Why? Because he David tricked them. He went down to the Philistine country and he served under Achish, king, the king of Gath, remember? And was even going to battle with them, they thought, at this time. So now he's moved to Hebron and they realize he's not really for us, he's against us, and now he's king of Israel. And when you get a new king, he's always tried with some kind of a, a, a conquest. So the Philistines are going to be used by God. And Philistine went up to search for David. David heard of it and went down to the stronghold. I have no idea which stronghold he's talking about here, but he went down to it anyway. The, verse 18. The Philistines also went and deployed themselves in the valley of Rephaim. So David inquired of the Lord. Well, why would he do that? <laughs> why would he inquire of the Lord? Because he's learning. He knows what he has to do, doesn't he? You, you got got a nation against you, all lined out, ready to fight you, and you got to go to war, don't you? See, this is exactly what we're talking about, folks. You know, I'm a little bit facetious, but I'm, I'm I'm not real facetious because this is serious stuff. When you go to do something, what do you do first? You talk to the Lord. You send Him a text. That's exactly right. You talk. You talk to Him and say, Lord, what should I do here? How should I move? How should I go? Well, yeah. A man the other day said, well, God doesn't, God doesn't speak to me. Yes, He does. But you've got to be quiet and you've got to listen and you've got to develop a, 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 a pattern in your life of trusting in Him. So David inquired of the Lord there. He inquired of the Lord saying, Shall I go up to the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, Go up and I will doubtless De deliver the Philistines your hand. So he said, should I go to war against the Philistines? And God said what? Go ahead, go ahead and the battle's already won. That's what he said. You're, you're going to win. So David went to Baal Perazim and David defeated them there and he said, David didn't want to take credit for it, the Lord has broken through my enemies before me like a breakthrough of water, like a flood. The, the Lord came on those guys like a flood there. All I had to do was stand and watch them being washed away. Therefore, he called the name of that place Baal Perazim. The word Baal Perazim means the Lord breaks through. Who fought the battle? The Lord. The Lord. How would you like to go to battle like that? Amen. Knowing in advance you're going to win the battle. Knowing in advance that God is going to fight the battle for you. And that's the way it is in the Christian life. You can fight it if you want to, but that's what God <laughs> wants us to do. You turn everything over to Him, and He says, well, this is what I'll do. But He doesn't always say, this is what I'll do. Sometimes He says, no, listen to this. And felt their images. They, he, they ran there. They left their images. That's their idols. That's their tariff them there. They took their idols with them to war. That's the Philistines. They took them with them, but they, got, they left in such a hurry that they left their idols. And David and his men carried them away. First Chronicles will tell you that they, buried, they, they carried them away and then they burned them. So these are the idols of the Philistines as they're running. They dropped their idols. Then the Philistines went up once again. They didn't learn their lesson. The Philistines went up once again and deployed themselves in the valley of Rephim. Therefore David inquired of the Lord and he said, uh, and he said to them, what he inquired, the Lord said, Shall I go up against the Philistines? And he said, you shall not go. Do you hear that? I'm sure glad he inquired, aren't you? The 
first time he said, it'd be very easy to think that God is going to always work in the same pattern. God never works in the same pattern. That's why you have to stay in touch with Him. He never, he never does what you think He's going to do. He said, shall I go up against Philistine? Yes. Shall I go up against Philistine? No. Don't go up there. i got a better plan. You shall not go up, but circle around behind them and come up, uh, in, come up on them in front of the mulberry trees. There's a line of mulberry trees there. So you go to the mulberry trees and just hold on right there. And it shall be when you hear the sound of the marching in the tops of the mulberry trees, then you shall advance quickly. So you stay there by the mul mulberry trees until when? Well, until you hear the sound in the top of the trees of marching. That's the marching of Philistines. And then I'll tell you what to do. How did that sound get in the mulberry trees? How did he get there? Well, who's running, who's running the show? God's running a show. God's, God can have amplification if He wants to, and He's using mulberry trees to do it right here. And it shall be when you hear the sound of marching in the top of the mulberry trees. I've listened to mulberry trees. I got one out in front of my house. I've never heard any sounds of marching. I put, I put my ear up close. Do you know why I haven't heard? Because God is not speaking in the mulberry trees. Look at me. They're not much other use. Them. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're messy, aren't they? Though? <laughs> then you shall advance quickly. When you hear that sound, then you shall advance quickly. For then the Lord will go out before you to strike the camp of the Philistines. And David did so as the Lord commanded him. And he drove back the Philistines from Geba as far as Gezer. That's 15 to 20 miles. He chased them away from there. Who did? The Lord. God did. The Lord did. What's... Uh, What's the message today? Any, any application for our lives? What, I know what I said, but what did you hear? Huh? If you're going to be with the Lord, you've got to be all in. You establish a relationship with Him by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And from that moment on, God wants to take all that you are, which is nothing, and make all that He is out of you, which is everything. What do you think? Wow. How you doing? Wow. <laughs> you know, sobering thought, but you know, so many times we can get so complacent in our walk with the Lord that we forget what we're walking for or who we're trusting as we walk. And we can get so casual about these things. And so you, you hear a lesson like this and you see this King David, who he, he's not perfect. He's still a man. He's going to make more mistakes. We'll come on that later on too. But he made some mistakes before while he's running for 10 years, but he learned some things while he's running for 10 years. He learned that God will take care of all his adversity. <coughs> what are your thoughts? It's got to be. Wendy. I was thinking of Patton. Patton? Word. Yeah. Slapping a soldier for being a coward. Used rather crude language. And yet he loved the Lord. <laughs> it's amazing. Well, I'll talk to you about that sometime. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure he did. I, I, just, I just read The Killing of Patton, so I don't know. I don't know. Oh. Maybe. Okay. He thought he did anyway. He, he believed in reincarnation as well, you know. Oh yeah, you need to read the book one day. Oh, he did wonderful things. I'm not saying that. Battle of the Bulge still remembers him. Yes, yes. I think God. Uh, I think God told us something else in that part there where the blind and the lame. Yes. Were going there. Uh, the way I read that is that they were. Literally, this was the political correctness of that day. They were looking at David, and they were figuring David's a good guy. So David's not going to go out and uh, attack blind and lame people. So that's why they put him there. They figured, hey, you know, he's, he's going to have to just kind of say that's no it. because it. he's too good a guy. Yeah. But David wasn't politically correct, and he wanted to get rid of him. That's interesting. You actually think they put the blind and lame out front. Yes. Like children or something like yes. that. That's an interesting thought. I never thought of that. So, very good. Anyone else? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, Mephibosheth? Yeah. Well, he's only five years old, and see, David's been running for ten years, so he's kind of lost track with Jonathan during that time. Good. It's a good question. 
that since Jonathan and David were such good friends, wouldn't he have known about Mephibosheth? Well, he might have, but if he had contact with him, but I don't think he's had contact with him for all those times he was running. The one time Jonathan did visit him, remember, but that's all I know. Good question. And he's 12 years old now, Doug. Yeah, he asked in the ninth chapter if there's anyone he can show kindness to. Yeah, so he yeah. didn't know there, did he? He didn't know. Yeah, that's exactly right. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Thank you for the privilege that we have had here today to open your word and to study it together. Thank you, Lord, that no one forces us to come. No one forces us to listen, but do so, do so that we might learn from you. And I pray, Lord, that you might remind us of what we heard today, that God will take care of all our diversities. God is sufficient to, for all of our needs. We don't need to fret. We don't need to worry. We need to trust in him. And I remember that you told us, Lord, that uh, uh, in Philippians 4, that we are to be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, we let our request be made known unto you. And then the peace of God that passes all understanding will keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. What a promise. We claim it today as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. If I were you, no, thank you. If I were you, I would not miss Oh, Next week, don't miss uh, uh, Obed Edom. Uh, you've got to come for Obed Edom.